Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Follow that now, Bishop. I'm trying, I'm trying. I'll get my composure first. Oh, good afternoon. It is so good to be with you here in the North Central District of the South Georgia Conference and to have this opportunity to, to share with you. Uh, not only am I, Rick, trying to get over the wonderful song, um, uh, but over the, uh, the faces that I see, amen. Um, some of you have gone from red hair to other hair <laughs> over the years. Um, some have gone from hair to no hair amen, over the years, and I guess you'll probably tell me what I've gone from as well over these years. It's so good to see so many friends and faces of persons who have walked a, a journey with me of my life, and to be invited to come back and to be with you is indeed a joy uh, to my soul and to my spirit. I will say to you also that uh, Delphine's absence is not because she did not desire to be here with you um, uh, in South Georgia, but because about seven weeks ago, we were blessed with our 11th granddaughter and 11th grandchild, but uh, who happened to be a daughter, amen. And uh, she is now with Janae. Some of you might remember Janae as a very small child, and now uh, she is married and uh, has had her first child. Uh, living in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, and uh, Delphine is there with her, helping her transition. Uh, this is her first full week, last week was her first full week back to work after having a child, and this week will be a week that she'll transition uh, uh, from um, the child being totally at home uh, to spending some time even uh, in daycare. So Delphine is making sure uh, that it's done right, and now I am further. <laughs> down on the totem pole as things go. So she did tell me, however, to make sure that I I'll let you all know how much um, she would love to have been here and to make sure I give the proper wave, okay, uh, to the United Methodist women. And that's kind of an inside story that maybe some of you all know about, some of you don't know about it. <laughs> but again, thank you for the invitation, Rick, to be here. And uh, why don't you join me once again in, in showing our appreciation to the Wesley Hands. Amen. Thank you. Those of you who know me well, uh, I guess, and I would say Daddy Rick does know me well enough that he knows that whenever I come to preach, uh, he must make sure that there's good music, amen, amen. and great singing, because that's something James Swanson is not known for, amen, is great singing, uh, not at all, amen. Uh, I want to, um, to use um, a passage of scripture uh, from the book of Acts for your listening um, ear for this afternoon. Acts chapter six, beginning with verse one, and I'll conclude with verse four, and I'm gonna be reading from the New Century Version. Uh, please hear these words. The number of followers was growing, but during this same time, the Greek-speaking followers had an argument with the other Jewish followers. The Greek-speaking widows, widows excuse me, were not getting their share of the food that was given out every day. The 12 apostles called the whole group of followers together and said, it is not right for us to stop our work of teaching God's word in order to serve tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven of your own men who are good, full of the spirit and full of wisdom. We will put them in charge of this work. Then we can continue to pray and teach the word of God. This is God's word for us, the very people of God. Thank you. Let us pray. And now, God, I pray you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for indeed you are our strength. And we bless you that you are our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. May we all say amen. 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 Transforming trouble 
into treasures, transforming trouble into treasures. How often do we find ourselves engaged in life and to even make it more specific, how often do we find ourselves engaged in ministry and we become somewhat paralyzed by the challenges that ministry presents to us. It is very easy for us to do that. To focus our attention on the things that we don't like about ministry or the challenges or the squeaky door that seems to always be asking for more oil or the person who seems to get on your nerve all of the time or maybe the situation or circumstance or the challenge that keeps coming up even though you have given it probably more attention than you want it to. And how difficult it is for you to let it go and to not allow it to distract you from the things around you that are going well. Listen to us and listen well to our conversations. Here we are, people of Almighty God who claim with every breath in our bodies that we are the sons and daughters of God most high. Now, there's something about being a son or daughter of God, even saying that sounds kind of pompous, amen kind of places you on a different level, a different plane from the rest of the people in this world. To even claim that somehow there is something special about you. Because when you really think about it, all people of the world, their origin springs from God. Amen? Come on, y'all. Don't get so stiff about this. This is not one of those pop quizzes that you might have here at Wesleyan that may get you in trouble. Amen. But we all know, at least within the framework of Christianity, we do believe that every person can find their origin in God. And yet we Christians seem to be uh, really bent on saying that there is something special about our relationship with God that others do not have. Maybe it's because we are not ashamed to claim God as the uh, one who gave breath for us, his own breath, that we might become living beings. And because of it, we proclaim that we are the sons and daughters of God most high. Now, I would say to you, in claiming that, uh, then that would invariably say that somehow we ought to act like who we claim that we spring from. Come on now. I mean, uh, I have, you heard Rick say I have six children, amen, amen. And who I, I'm so proud of, uh, two daughters and four boys, amen, and them daughters make sure I don't uh, disclaim them at all, especially when they need something, you know. <laughs> but it is obvious even when people have not met my children, when they see them, they always will invariably say, oh, you can't deny them, amen. They, they look so much like you. And even with this new granddaughter that's only about seven weeks old, I, I've looked at her real close, and, and I found my mark, amen. Yeah. Think about her that, that, that makes her Swanson, amen. She has dimples, and everybody knows that all the dimples in the Swanson family come from me, amen. And, and so that, that's my child, you, so when you claim that God is the source of your existence, every now and then you ought to give some sign to the world that uh, your creator is alive and well inside of you and that you ought to at least shine for some kind of light that helps people to see that God is alive in you, in the ways in which you walk, the ways in which you talk, and the ways in which you live your life. 
Now, I do believe that one thing that I have noticed about God that we need to begin to emulate, and that is no matter what challenge comes to God, no matter how difficult the situation might be, no matter how awesome the opponent might be, God is never at a loss in the midst of those circumstances or conditions. God always believes that God is going to come out victorious no matter who it is or what it is that God faces. And you and I are sons and daughters of God. We should never, ever be troubled by the situations and circumstances that we meet in our lives. We ought to be able to say, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loves me. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise in this house. We serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. And I know he lives, and because of that, no enemy who comes against me, his weapon shall not prosper because God is on my side. And I do know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to God's purposes. May be a little inconvenience might happen. And maybe it might look like there is a delay that is going on, but God will ultimately win. You remember the liberation of the children of Israel out of the clutches of the Egyptian slave masters. Do you remember that? One thing we often forget is that in delivering them, God deliberately chose not to take them by the shortcut. Now, come on, Georgia folk. All of y'all were not raised in the city. Amen. You know about shortcuts. Amen. God deliberately led them by the long way. In other words, it was by no accident that it took them 40 years to get to the promised land when they could have gotten there in a much shorter time period. God was deliberate in what God did. God knew that they needed some time to go from uh, slavery into freedom, that they were not ready to go straight from slavery into freedom. They had to now begin, God had to now begin to work on them, to transfer them from a slavery mentality to a freedom mentality. That if he would have given them freedom at that time, they would have squandered what God was giving them. And sometimes there are inconveniences in our lives that we want to say, get behind me, Satan. Not always the devil. Oh, Lord, have mercy. It's not always the devil that's causing you problems. Sometimes it's you <laughs> that's causing the delay. You're just not ready for what God's trying to give you. And God has to delay you before God will bless you. Sometimes God takes those things to transform you so that you can be ready for the blessing God's getting ready to give you. Go back to the text and look at what's going on in the early church. And a lot of times we like to romanticize so much about the early church. I mean, you ever look at your church and you see all of the problems that come up in the church. I mean, you know, um, Bishop King and and Rick and all of those superintendents get together and they huddle in those rooms and don't tell you what's going on, hey man. And, and it bothers you to no end because you already know where everybody ought to go anyhow. They should just call you, hey man. You know? Yeah. And in the midst of all of that, but you look at your church and you look at all of the challenges that are there that you have to face each and every day as that church tries to live out the mission God has given specifically to that congregation. Yeah, I know that there's an overall mission for the whole church, but also each church, as you are planted 
in a community, God expects you to carry out specific missions in that community. And you need to get busy finding out what that's all about. And so as you look at that, sometimes it looks very daunting. And in the midst of it, as you begin to try to talk about it, sometimes as you see that challenge, there will be those in the midst of your church who will say invariably, we can't afford it. Or it's just too much for us to change. It's too difficult for us to do this. Have you ever thought that maybe the difficulty is really the transformation process? Just listen close. Maybe God has put the challenge there because there is something inside of you that needs to be changed. It's not so much the community needs to change, but maybe the people who meet in the building needs to be changed. Oh, come on, just stay with me a little while longer. <laughs> just, just a little while longer. I'm going back to Mississippi, amen. <laughs> just stay with me a little while longer. Maybe, perhaps, maybe God placed those people in the community, not for you to go out and do anything for them, but maybe for them to challenge you so you would grow in the Lord. I mean, isn't that a kind of a unique way of seeing these things? Rather than seeing them as needing you, maybe you need them. Oh, my God. Now, if we turn it around that way, doesn't it change the whole equation? You know, it's sort of like when Delphine and I decided we would get married. It didn't take her long to convince me that I wasn't the great catch. Amen that I really needed her rather than she needed me. Amen, I started dressing better. I started smelling better. I started talking better. I learned how to smile and I showed up, started eating better. I knew I needed her. Church, have you ever thought about the fact it's not the community that needs you? Maybe you need the community to do what God has uniquely gifted you to do on God's behalf. Give God, hey, a hand clap of praise in this house. Because you see, what God is trying to do is to help you Work out your soul salvation. Since you know him already. Oh my God. What happens here, and this is, this is something I like to, to mess with folk about. We United Methodists, we're struggling so hard, and I thank God for it. I want us to praise him for it. That at least we're trying to be an inclusive church. Come on. At least we're trying. We don't get it right all the time, but we're at least trying, y'all. So, so, stop, so stop fussing at us about it. Quit fighting with us about it. At least we're trying. If you would learn to praise God, at least for the efforts, maybe God would help us to get a breakthrough. Instead of always complaining all the time, talking about how bad the church is, you wait until the church is taken out of the world. My brothers and sisters, at least we're trying when I look at the General Conference, I saw a video the other day at BMCR, the General Conference of 1939, 1940. They took a picture of it. There were two or three black faces in it. And then the General Conference that we had about 50 or 60 years later, and we had more black faces, we had Hispanic faces, we had Native American faces, and I said, oh, praise God, if we would learn to at least see what God is doing in our midst and how God is transforming us. And if we would at least lift that up and give God praise for what God is doing, maybe God might do more for us. Instead of sitting around all the time, pole mouthing, we ought to be praising God. Now, in Mississippi, we call that glory sightings. Where have you seen God at work? I wouldn't work for somebody if I didn't see him paying off every now and then. Why are you saying you're working for God and God has never paid you off? He pays me off all the time. Got a friend of mine named Tom Bowman. He and his brother are twins, Tim and Tom Bowman in South Carolina. 
Years ago, Uncle Sam sent one of them a draft card. I drafted him, and this, you know, this dear uncle, uh, dear young man, Uncle Sam needs you letter. And the other brother said, well, you're not going without me. And they both went in. And they were stationed in Vietnam, and they were out on patrol. And the Viet Cong came in and shot up the whole uh, platoon of them, about 13 of them. And Tom and Tim, one of them took, Tim took seven bullets. Tom took two. And when the helicopters came in to try and rescue them. They were the only two who survived. And they were holding each other's hands. About a year and a half ago, Tom was out riding his bicycle. This is way after Vietnam. And all of a sudden, a pain hit him. And he fell forward. And he was paralyzed from his neck down. Come to find out this was the aftermath of that shooting that had happened while he was in Vietnam. And the doctor said, had you fallen backwards, you would have severed your clavicle and you would have died. So we were doing these glory sightings during the Gammon Theological Seminary's board meeting. And Tom said to me, he said, well, this is my glory sighting. He said, every morning that I wake up and I open my eyes and I see another day, he said, my hands go up. And I say, thank you, Lord. He said, because if God hadn't been with me in Vietnam, and if he had not been with me when I was on that bicycle that day, I would not be here. Glory sightings are not when God did something spectacular, Derek, and helped you to raise a million dollars. But when God gave somebody a dollar and 25 cents to buy them a loaf of bread that kept them from eating for just one more day. We in the church ought to teach our folk that God never leaves us. God never forsakes us. God is always working on our side. Every Sunday, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday ought to be shouting day in the houses of the people of God because we know he is paying off every day. Oh, bless his name. Yes, he is. And when we get more excited about what God is doing in our lives, then the transformation we want to see happen, it will happen. Now, what happens with these folk? They got to fussing over food that was given for everybody. And some unscrupulous person decided they were going to favor one crowd over against another crowd. Isn't that something? Church folk. <laughs> Church folk playing games. You know, it's all like having the kitchen committee. Amen. You know, and you happen to bake the best German chocolate cake, and they know it. And when dinner time comes after church, and you look around, no German chocolate cake is sitting out there. Well, what happened to the German chocolate cake? It's in that other person's car. <laughs> church folk doing all kind of stuff like that. My God. When that trouble came in the church, look how the disciples handled it. They transformed it. Instead of getting into this arguing about who was right and who was wrong, they said, choose among yourselves some leaders who can do it the right way. Every time the church hits one of those walls, but we can't seem to get past. And most of the time, it has nothing to do with mission. Most of the stuff we fuss over has nothing to do with mission. I'm going to say it again. Most of the stuff that we fuss over has nothing to do with mission. It has nothing to do, we fight more in church over whether or not the new carpet's going to be green, blue, or black. Come on. Then we do whether or not the kids outside of our doors are going to be fed, and whether or not they're going to see the love of God in our eyes when they come into church. We fuss more over that kind of stuff than we do over whether or not mission is going to happen in our churches. And that stuff stalls us. And do you know people leave church more over that kind of fussing than they do over the mission of the church all of the time? Because 
the one who is working against us knows that it's the little foxes that clip the vine. It's the little things that trip us up. And so the reason when you come to the North Central District meetings, you ought to come with some glory sightings about the things that are going on in your churches that don't show up on the payment of apportionments, that sometimes don't even show up about how many professions of faith you've had. It don't show up about how many folk have been baptized, but it shows up when it's an all-white congregation that has learned to accept that there's some black folk in the community and we have gone out to share the gospel regardless of the color of the skin of folk who are in our community because we know God is holding us accountable to share his good news hey, with everybody. We can have some glory sightings in the North Central District when we stop fussing over this stuff and get it right with God and we come and we can turn this place out because God will be pleased with us when we start transforming our lives. Don't you want to see it happen? I long for the day when I got to Mississippi. I said, oh my God. I showed up in some of my churches that were supposed to be all Anglo. And I saw some black folk in there. And I, you know, see, y'all don't know how we do this. But black folk, we got our own little language. Oh, yeah, we do. Stand up, bro, man. Yeah. Everybody coming by, shaking my hand. He come by. I say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. He knows what I'm talking about. That's why he went to laughing. Amen. I'm trying to scope it out. And when I find out that they felt at home there, they felt warm and welcome there, I didn't care whether or not the folks shouted that Sunday on my preaching or not. Because the bishop left there encouraged that day. You understand what I'm saying? Mississippi? Come on, y'all. Come on. We need to be God's church. Quit letting this stuff mess us up about somebody getting more food than someone else. When we all need the love of God. I'm almost through. Amen. I've got one little thing here that's on the paper that I've got to say. Then I'm going to be through. Amen. I'm going to be through. This is the consequences of biblical leadership. That's what it is. It's biblical leadership. Biblical leadership. It is being a person who's been so transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ that you are willing to go against the norms of the community because your heart has been changed. It's been strangely warmed. And I guarantee you, in every one of the churches, you say, was it 104 you got? 104 of the churches in the North Central District, there are people in your church whose hearts have been strangely warmed. They mess you up, don't they? They do. Yes. When I was in South Georgia, I had members who messed me up. They would come to me, Reverend Swanson, we got a housing project. I said, yeah, yeah. We need to do something about that. I said, yeah. yeah. What if I do something about that? I can't go visit all them sick folk. I'm Swanson, we go visit the sick folk. You go get them children. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, sometimes we use, come on, come on. You talk about St. Mary's Road and I grew. Oh, I lapped up all of the accolades. Oh, I felt good. But it was the people in the church whose hearts were strangely warm who transformed the preacher and helped him to understand that he had to be more than just a walking, talking preacher. He had to be the living presence of Jesus 
to do the Star Trek thing, to boldly go <laughs> where no preacher had ever gone before. Oh my God. Are there some places like that in your communities where God is calling you to boldly go where no preacher has ever gone before? Take the flag of your church. Go into those communities and put your flag down and say in the name of Jesus, this is United Methodist territory and I claim it in God's name. Oh, bless his name. If we would but do that, we would turn South Georgia upside down. And I guarantee you, you've got a superintendent who will stand behind you if you do it. Because I know the phone going to ring, Rick, when you do that. But when you start seeing them little children come in, Lord, when they start coming in St. Mary's Road, scared me to death, Rick Mitchell. I still remember you. Scared me to death. When them little kids started coming in, little snotty nose, getting the hymn books and writing all in them. Mr. Patrick had bought all of those hymn books in, in memory of his wife that he loved so dear, who had died a premature death. And I was waiting on him to come and tell me about it. But then Ann Justice said, I know how we can fix this. I said, huh? She said, let's just buy some coloring books. They'd much rather have the coloring books and the crayons than to have the hymn books. Oh, bless his name. You can take your troubles and allow those troubles through the power of Almighty God to be transformed into treasures that bless your church, that bless the community, and most of all, bring a smile on God's face. Do you want to see God smile? Oh, I know I do. I want to see him smile. I want to hear him say, well done. Good and faithful servant. I want to see it happen. President Knox, I want to see it. I believe he smiled. When the Wesley Ann song, every time a young woman comes to this college, he smiles. That it was not in New York, but it was in Georgia where the first woman's college was established. Y'all ought to tell that story all over the world. We in the South get a bad rap because we don't tell our story. We ought to tell our story. Y'all talk about how progressive y'all are up there. We had to teach y'all how to educate women. <laughs> Learn to tell your story. At least black folk and white folk talk to each other here. Tell your story. Give God glory and praise his name and forgive a bishop for preaching too long. <laughs> this is how I'd like for us to end together. Rick, if you'll come stand with me, and you're a district lay leader, if you'll come and stand with me too. District lay leader, if you'll come stand with me. And I'm glad to see you all doing this. In Mississippi, we are really trying hard to model what we call collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership. Because people need it today, because folk divide us up so much. Clergy and lay against each other. You ever seen a shepherd against the sheep? That's crazy. We need each other. What I'd like to do at this time is this. Very easy, very easy, very easy, very easy. And that is for you to search your heart. When was the last time you saw a glory sighting? When was the last time God did something so wonderful in your life? Maybe not what you wanted God to do. God did something wonderful. 
and you kept that story to yourself and you didn't tell anybody about it. If we would spend more time, no wonder the world is so disbelieving today. We don't tell those stories now. So I want you to do this to me, for me tonight, just this right quick. I want you to, if you can and you will, just to stand on your feet. And if you have been somewhat recalcitrant about telling folk about your glory sightings, I want you to be willing to at least say, Lord, I am rather shy about that. I live in a very hostile world today where sometimes people don't want to hear Christians speak about what God is doing. Help me to find out how to say that. Teach me how to share when you do something wonderful. And in fact, it doesn't have to be something wonderful for me. But I saw you do something wonderful. Teach me how to do that. Because the world needs to hear good news, y'all. And they need to be able to give credit to where credit is due. I want to pray for you that you'll be able to take the trash and the clutter of your life and to let God transform it into treasures that you can share with the rest of the world. And while I'm praying, if you're here today, and I don't know why God's saying this, but if you're here today, and that's happening for you right now, Maybe God has been speaking to your heart about becoming more active in the ministry of your church, your district, your conference, or just maybe God is calling you to put your whole life on the line. You may be a layperson here today, and you've been thinking in your heart and your mind, you know, perhaps maybe God is calling me full-time Christian service. I never thought about it because I, my life is such a, it's not what I envision a preacher ought to be. You'd be surprised what we used to be. And you'd be surprised what we still are, amen. <laughs> and how God's still transforming our lives and how God uses us in ways we never dreamed. I, I, I was telling Marcus, as he brought me in, went to a little church. It was a six or five, five point charge when I was in the Knoxville area. And I walked out and looked in the nave. And um, our superintendent asked me, Why are you doing that? And I asked him what these, what, what did he think, how much, how many people could sit in that sanctuary? He said, About 100, 125. And I said, I thought so. We went on to the car. And he said, Now you got to tell me what, what was that all about. And I said, Well, when you look at that church, that was the size of my dream. That was my dream. All I wanted to do was to pastor about 100 people. I think if I could ever get a church with that many, I was going to be tough. That's all I wanted. The little church I came from, there wasn't that many people there. I never dreamed of being a bishop. In fact, the day they elected me, I cried like a baby because I didn't think it was going to happen. I'm serious. And I was just as happy to come back to South Georgia. Now, some of you don't believe that. But I know. I'm just telling you. That was never my dream. My dream was to have a church of 100 people. And I learned from that that God's dream for you is always larger than your dream for yourself. Always. Always. As you look at the glory side that God has done in your life, and while I'm praying, God is talking to you and pulling you into a realm that you did not think about. While every head is bowed and all eyes are closed, 
If you want to come up and confess that, please feel free to do it. Or if perhaps along the way you've kind of given up on God, but you've just been dutiful and you're tired of being dutiful, you really want to recommit yourself to God, please feel free to do that. Please come forward while we are praying. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And when I realized just how much you loved me, I could not help but respond by giving myself to someone I could trust to love me just the way I am. And I thank you for loving me as James, not as Bishop, but as James. And I bless you for it. And I bless you for these people here today who despite the threat of rain and hail and thunder and lightning who came out today. And I pray that they would see how you work in their lives each and every day. And that you haven't forsaken us. You haven't forgotten about us. But there are so many glory sightings that happen around us each and every day. Help us to have eyes to see and sometimes even ears to hear of your glory and your love for us that we might bask therein and touch hearts and minds of those who may be sensing you calling them and those who need to renew their vows. In Jesus' name I pray and we give you thanks for it. Let every heart say amen. Amen. We are partnered through a great church to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God. The Coastal District yoked their arms together because we are better together. So will you reach across the aisles and will you join hands as we yoke together? And as you do so, Bishop, I want you to ask to stand in front of these little ladies. Right, right here. No, you get right in the middle of them. Get in there. Get in there, Bishop. And as we yoke together, Bishop, it is the custom in the United Methodist Church where there is a bishop present to give the benediction. Bishop, will you give it at this time? Let us pray. And now, Lord, we do thank you for your holy presence in this place. And may what we have heard through song, prayer, and word May it find a place of fertile soil within our hearts. And may it grow into uh, being a transforming instrument by your power and by your presence. And so unto you, who's able to keep us from falling, who's able to present us faultless before your throne of grace, may there be all glory, power, dominion, and all that is, may we offer it unto you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. May we all say, Amen. Amen. God bless you and good night.